All right, thank you very much for the introduction. So thank you very much to the students who are organizing this conference. I think you've done a great job today. Everything's running very smoothly. So let's get a round of applause for them from all the faculty who have sit back. And so thank you for, again for the invitation to talk. I want to, um, we'll share some of the research that we've been doing in collaboration with John Rogers, who's here at, at the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois. Um, and we'll talk, and since this is a student conference, you can feel free to interrupt me at any time, ask questions. If you want to know more about my career path, um, trajectory, things I've done, um, feel free to ask at any time or come up afterwards. Um, so we work on incorporating flexible silicon, silicon electronics directly into the electrode tissue interface. We want to do this so we can really improve the ability of us to capture information from the brain um, and over large areas. So our motivation for doing this is that implantable devices have to evolve tremendously, but the basic electrode tissue interface to the brain hasn't really changed very much in 50 years. And so these are some examples of systems that are currently in use in patients. These are responsive neurostimulator uh, and vagus nerve stimulator. And these are devices with uh, pretty impressive uh, computational capabilities, wireless capabilities, long battery life. But they would really rely on very simple, very crude electrode tissue interface devices. And so what would we really like to have instead is dense sampling over very large areas of the brain. And so if you take a look at some of the currently available state-of-the-art clinical devices, these feature uh, large electrodes, uh, so three or four millimeter discs, spaced almost a centimeter apart. And so if you think about this from neuroanatomy, underneath each one of these electrodes, there's over 12 million neurons. And so we're trying to sample all of that activity with just one contact. And the limiting factor in all of this has been wiring. We'll talk more about that, but if you can imagine this bundle of cabling, and this is what we regularly implant in patients with epilepsy. Uh, and this is to diagnose patients with epilepsy that have failed one or more medications and are candidates for surgery. We place these devices on the surface of the brain, we map out epileptic regions, and then based on this crude set of information, we go back in and cut out a big area of the brain under the hopes that we can try and treat their, their seizures. And this, these surgeries are pretty ineffective at best. They're sort of uh, 40 to 60% likely to give you seizure freedom or even a reduction in seizures. So you're undergoing a pretty invasive surgery for a pretty low chance of surgical success. So instead, we'd like to build better technology to understand what's going on in the brain at a much finer scale and try to come up with better ways of treating epilepsy without removing large chunks of brain. So some of the other attempts have been made to capture information from, from very high resolution from very small regions of brain. So this example of a device that's very popular for research, for research in brain-machine interface. It's the Utah Electrode Array, um, and it features a hundred, about 100 electrodes that cover an area of 4 by 4 millimeters. And in context, you can see just how much, how little of the brain surface that can really cover. So it gives you a very nice picture of high resolution activity, but from a very small area. And so our, our group and other groups have looked at using hybrid electrode arrays, and that is incorporating small micro wire bundles into the surface electrode, just to give us an idea of what kind of activity is occurring on the surface of the brain um, in between these larger electrodes. And so these are spaced a millimeter apart. And so we look at this electrical activity in epilepsy patients, and we found events we're calling micro seizures. Uh, these are events that occur on a single electrode and not a millimeter away. And they look just like the clinical um, seizures we observe, but we don't see them spreading throughout the brain. We see other events, micro uh, periodic leptiform discharges, again on a small number of these micro electrodes and not spreading very far apart, uh, as well as these high frequency oscillations. These are short transient bursts of sinusoidal activity that are again confined to very small regions of the brain. So we don't really know what these, uh, these activity are doing to contribute to large scale clinical seizures, but we need a, 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 we need a technology that will allow us to record all of this microactivity and piece that together. And so we, we're looking at ways we can do this. We'd like to cover an area that's approximately eight by eight centimeters. So this is a six by six centimeter grid, and this patient actually had two of these different grids implanted. Um, so we'd like to cover a pretty significant area of the brain. But if we wanted one mill, even one millimeter spacing across the brain, 
using individually wired electrodes, using currently available technology, we would need 6,400 electrodes and correspondingly 6,400 wires. So you can imagine this is about 100 something wires and what would happen if we tried to increase the wiring density even further. Uh, because these devices, now after they, they've been implanted, the surgeon will go back in and place the skull back on top, the, the bone fragment of the skull, and they close up the dura on top of these devices. Um, and so any additional volume of material we place inside these patients causes more pressure on the brain, more risk of injury. So if anything, we'd like to de decrease the amount of wiring and while simultaneously increasing the amount of electrical, uh, electrical coverage we have. So the solution to this has been known for a long time. We need multiplexing. We need an ability to record from thousands of contacts using a much smaller number of wires. Uh, and so some groups have looked at this as early as 1986. Uh, they've incorporated silicon transistors directly at the electrode tissue interface and as a way of combining signals from many electrodes to a much smaller number of wires. But all these approaches have been, in the past have been limited by the material they're built on. Uh, they've all been built on rigid silicon that is inflexible. It can't conform to the surface of the brain. So that it can make penetrating arrays that can be pushed into the brain, but not ones that can really conform to the irregular surface. And so we're interested in building devices that are extremely flexible. We want to record from the irregular surfaces of the brain, but also get access to areas that are previously been, have been inaccessible, like inside of uh, sulci and uh, uh, inside of soul sign in between the two hemispheres of the brain. Uh, we'd also like to have devices that can sample at about one kilohertz to fully capture the information that's available. So I've mentioned uh, high frequency oscillations. So these are short bursts of, of high frequency activity. This is an example of something happening at, a, at 100 hertz and they happen up to about 500 hertz. And so we don't yet fully know the physiologic meaning of these oscillations. We do observe them in epileptic patients as well as normal patients, albeit at a lower rate in normal patients. So we think they're a marker of epileptic, act, uh, epileptic tissue. Further, we'd like a device that can measure brain signals with very low noise. We're looking at microvolt signals, tens of microvolts, hundreds of microvolts, uh, and also do all, meet all of these requirements while consuming a very small amount of power. So we need this device to, to uh, at first, first pass, needs to consume such a small amount of power that doesn't heat the brain by more than one degree Celsius. Uh, and of course, the power requirements are even much more strict if we want to run the device on batteries. And so when I started this project uh, as part of my PhD, we, we met up with um, John Rogers. I sort of found the research of John Rogers here, who had figured out a technique for building flexible and stretchable circuitry using very thin pieces of silicon. And the idea is that silicon, by, um, by when, we, when we think of silicon wafers, we think of very rigid, brittle material. Uh, but if you make it extremely thin, it can be very, very flexible. The same way, this is a great analogy that he uses, that if you have a piece of two by four lumber and a sheet of paper, one is inherently flexible, one is inflexible, but they're the same material. So he figured out that if you make the silicon transistors on 100 nanometer th uh, thick nano ribbons of silicon, you can make them flexible and even stretchable. And so we collaborated to develop the medical applications of this technology. And so we, we started by developing these arrays of active electrodes. And since this is a, a student com, uh, a conference, I thought I'd throw in a little bit of background. Everyone's probably seen a very basic circuit diagram. This is how all these devices work. Um, there's a signal recorded from each electrode on the surface of the device that's connected to the gate of a flexible silicon transistor. And then there's a constant current sink provided off the array that forms a source follower amplifier. So we're really not providing any gain at these devices, just buffering. We want a nice low output impedance, uh, much lower than the impedance of the electrode, the electrode uh, on the brain. And so that allows us to do multiplexing as we'll see later. And so this is a device we have, we're currently building. Uh, this has 360 electrodes arranged in a 20 by 18 pattern. Uh, they have 500 micron spacing between electrodes. And because we've built those amplifiers, those source follower buffers and multiplexers directly into the electrode array, we can record from all of these electrodes with only 39 wires. So we can take a little bit of a look at what's going on inside each one of these cells. It's the same basic design that gets repeated over and over again. And it consists of two transistors, two flexible silicon transistors and of which one of them is connected uh, through this, this vertical connection to the surface electrode, the platinum surface contact, uh, directly to the gate of this buffer transistor. And there's a second transistor that provides a switch that turns on and off when we enable this row select signal that runs across the array. 
and allows that, that, trend, that, that electrode to connect to a shared column output line. And so all the electrodes in a given column share, um, share the same output wire, and off the array we provide this constant current buffer. So just running through this multiplexing with the same idea as we can turn on all the electrodes in row zero and sample all of their, their activity, then turn off row zero, cycle to row one, sample all the electrodes in row one. And if we can do this fast enough, if we can cycle through all the rows in the array, we can fully reconstruct the original signals that are available um, on the, across the brain. And so this device we built up in a series of fabrication steps and it starts off with as flexible silicon nano ribbons on a, that have been transfer printed using a rubber stamp onto this polyimid flexible substrate. So it could be on a number of different flexible materials and John's group has demonstrated active devices built on paper, on leather, on stretchable surgical gloves, um, really kind of any material they've been able to build circuits on it. In our case we're using polyimid. Uh, and then we, we build up the circuit interconnections that form the device in a number of steps that are on this flexible substrate and finally, we deposit platinum contacts on the surface for the electrodes. Now in cross-section, this device, uh, you can see the silicon located in the, in, the, in the middle of the device, and then numerous interconnect layers, and finally the platinum uh, electrodes on the surface. The whole stack right now is about 25 microns thick. So you can think of it as sort of a very flexible um, cellophane-like material. Um, so certainly, we like to make it much more flexible. We're working on making this thinner, making this even more flexible. but. It's still something that can conform to a, li to a little bit of curvature of the brain. So we've taken this device and done some preliminary experiments with it. Uh, we've, re we've placed this over a cat visual cortex from our, with our collaborators in neuroscience and we recorded from anesthetized animals uh, a vi visual evoke responses. We can also take this device because it's really flexible and insert it, insert it into the inner hemispheric fissure. So this lets us get down into that area and get at some previously air, uh, inaccessible areas of the brain that are very uh, hard to record from. We can also take this device and we actually fold it back on itself around its very thin sheet of PDMS, of, of rubber, and make a unique kind of double-sided recording uh, electrode. So we can record from both sides of this device. And we've also placed this in, in, into that inner hemispheric fissure as a model of what a human sulcus might be roughly dimensioned. And so we can show that we can record from both hemispheres of the brain as well as both sides of a sulcus. Do you have to do anything to decouple the two sides? Well, so the, yeah, so there is an, an insulator in between the two. And so each one of those electrodes is isolated and buffered. Just an insulator but, you need to wrap that as well. Hmm, that's a good point. If you want to really insulate the two, that would be a good, be a good idea to put something to really shield the back electrodes from the front. Yeah. It could be, that could be definitely done, so. Although a lot of the contact is directly, oh, the recording is from oh, right. uh, direct uh, electrical contact with the, the brain, so it's like uh, chemical contact. So, But that's a good idea. Uh, and so we can do experiments with this device, so we can record from the visual system. And so we've done some uh, evoked response, some very basic evoked response experiments, where these are uh, anesthetized animals. We're showing an 8x8 eight eight vis uh, checkerboard vis visual stimulus. And so this is an example of the movie that we, re that we, we show the animals while they're, uh, and record their responses. And so there's a box flashing in one of 64 locations, kind of a very uh, basic neuroscience experiment. And what we could show from this is that we can pull out features from the data, and this is the response for the entire electrode, uh, all 360 channels for a box presented in the upper left-hand corner of the visual field, and this is a box presented in the lower right-hand corner of the visual field. And so we can extract out some basic features like power and delay to the peak of the response and use these to train a classifier that does prediction. And so we are able to predict 36% of the locations exactly correct and 66% of them within one adjacent square. So not really very optimized, but a demonstration that we're able to record useful signals uh, that can be used to do decoding. Not quite as impressive as decoding YouTube movies, but uh, got to start, I guess, somewhere. So we'll try that one next, though. Um, no, we're not going to show YouTube movies to cats, I guess, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That might be fun. Yeah. So, so um, cat movies, right. There's a lot of cat movies on YouTube, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, getting back to epilepsy, that was our original purpose for these devices. <clears throat> we were able to uh, induce seizures in these animals uh, using drugs to try and look at how seizures propagate throughout the brain. 
So this is an example of what uh, clinicians currently look at. They look at electrode data a few channels at a time. Um, they plot it as raw voltage data. And they start trying to compare the waveforms between these, these channels. And so uh, if you or I look at this, these are three randomly selected channels from the array. Um, it's hard to see if there's any specific pattern. Maybe the shapes are a little bit different between those, those channels. Um, but with 360 of these channels, this is just a few seconds of data. This is not really a feasible thing to look through all of these channels. Uh, so instead, we plot this as a movie. We take the raw voltage data on top here and then represent the voltage as a color and then show the average of all 360 electrodes at the bottom as a correlate to what you would see with only one electrode in a square centimeter. So we're seeing a lot more information. Uh, we have 360 channels in the same space as one before. And when we plotted this seizure, a, a number of things really struck out, uh, struck our eye. And then we see complicated spatial patterns moving across the electrode array during this seizure. And so we see waves moving in different directions. They sort of start and rotate in one direction. Um, and then the waves sort of at some point decide to change directions and move in a different way. And, and then this whole pattern kind of continues um, throughout this seizure in a kind of very robust manner. Um, and this, is, this has been slowed down 20 times. So now we're looking at this very, um, very much slower scale than the original data. And so we're interested in, in taking these patterns and trying to characterize them and pull, pull out information about what is going on. Are they predictive to um, seizures? And are, are they informative for therapy? And so we looked at, at some of these patterns. We tried to pull out automated methods to analyze this data because, as you can see, this is just a few seconds of data. And we have hours and hours of these recordings that we can't review like this. We can't review manually. We needed automated methods. And so we started with a very simple analysis method. This is a basic spike detector. We're identifying spikes on all of the channels. Um, this is an example of a movie of one of those spikes. And so for this spike, we repeated three times. It appears to be very stereotyped. It starts in one direct all corner of the array and moves to another side of the array. So from that, we can calculate the delay from, from any channel to all the other channels, from the average uh, to all the other channels using cross covariance. And we can build a map that reduces that, uh, that original movie down to just one image that says that this spike moves from here to here. We can also extract the power in each spike, uh, in each electrode. And we can use those two sets of features. We can form PCA on them uh, to reduce from 720 dimensions down, down a little bit farther to about 60 dimensions. And then do clustering. We want to find out if those spatial patterns that we observe, are they repetitive? Um, or are they just all possible capability, all possible patterns occur within the data set? So really, is it one big cluster? Or are there, many, are there specific clusters within the data that are informative? So we use clustering, and then we use a gap statistic to look at the data. And this is in our data, but we're trying to find in a statistically significant way where the elbow is as you increase the number of clusters. So as you increase the number of clusters, the within cluster distance goes down. But at some point, there's diminishing returns. And so you might pick that, for example, for this toy set of data, that there are two clusters in the data. And so we did this with our data set, and we found 21 significant clusters in the data. Um, and this is an example of one of those clusters that really shows that all of these spikes, no matter where they occur in the recording at different times, they look very similar to each other, at least somewhat similar to each other, uh, but very different than spikes that occur in another cluster. And so these spikes were very stereotyped and looked and repeated this, this kind of pattern. And so now we can go back with these labels and look at that original seizure again. And we can look at um, la with labeled data. And we can make up labels for these patterns as well. Um, of course, the algorithm doesn't spit out the descriptive labels, but we can get, assign these descriptive labels. And it appears the seizure starts with one particular pattern, this plane wave, followed by these three counterclockwise spirals, clockwise spirals, sorry, and then another plane wave, um, and then this long period of prolonged counterclockwise rotation. Uh, and then finally, it seems to end with this wave, with wave moving right to left, and then the same wave repeated over and over again, that purple wave. So it's just a way of us looking at this raw data, pulling out patterns that are repetitive. We can do this across all of the data sets, across all the time we have. And so this, inform this has sort of led us down the question of what do we do with this data? Uh, we're interested in comparing these patterns to uh, now that we have all these clusters and all these labels, what is the relationship between these types of spikes and seizure initiation, seizure propagation, and ultimately seizure termination? 
So we'd like to figure out if there are specific patterns that either precede seizures or end seizures, can we identify when seizures are going to occur and cause them to either not occur or to terminate sooner through electrical stimulation. And so this is what we started to work on now in my group. We're developing electrode arrays that incorporate multiplex stimulation as well as recording directly in, in the array so that we can try and deliver the same stimulus that we identify from the recordings that might terminate the seizure. So we can try and deliver this uh, kind of wavefront stimulation to block moving and recurrent patterns that are moving across the brain. So to summarize a little bit, the electrodes we've built so far are about 25 microns thick. They're pretty conformal to the brain. We have some techniques with silk that we were working on that we've published a little bit earlier about how to make them even thinner. Those devices were two and a half microns thick. So we'd like to make them much thinner, much more flexible. Uh, we're building arrays that have up to 1,024 contacts. The next devices we're building are, are even, even more electrodes uh, with even finer spacing. We have some other designs that push the spacing down to 250 microns. We sort of think this might be a good place to um, uh, sort of match the natural resolution of the surface of the brain of the information available. Uh, because we're using this high, this, uh, high performance monocrystal in silicon, we can switch between all those multiplex channels pretty quickly. And so we can sample each of the electrodes at up to 10 kilohertz per channel uh, in these devices. And so much probably faster than we need right now. We need about one to two kilohertz. And we've integrated multiplexing and amplification at each electrode, and so the 1024 channel array will have 37 wires. In the future, we're looking to scale this to even more, even thousands of electrodes and uh, even fewer wires as we try to work towards, uh, towards larger coverage, larger animals, and uh, chronic implants. Some of the devices we're building and uh, some of the future work, we're just starting in my lab, so I've just had um, all my students just, just started. I've been recruiting students and building the lab and and uh, ordering equipment, and so we're just starting some of these projects to incorporate stimulation at all of the electrodes, uh, as well as building devices that can be chronically implanted. All the things that we've shown so far are uh, acute experiments, and so we've exposed the brain, placed the electrode on the brain. So we're working on how do we implant these chronically over long periods of time. Uh, we're interested in incorporating wireless capabilities, so we have a sort of mock-up of you know, a, a concept sketch where we're going to take inflexible silicon and attach it directly to the subflexible substrate at the periphery, at the areas where it doesn't need to be that flexible, and use that inflexible silicon to do analog digital conversion, to do the control signals, and ultimately build in the wireless capabilities we need to get this data out of the, out of the head. And finally, we're looking at um, using these devices for brain-machine interfaces. We're partnering with a collaborator in neuroscience in the Center for Neuroscience, Bijan Pesseron, um, who's working on looking at BCI and improving BCI, looking at LFP and looking at these arrays. And we're hope, our hope is that by taking arrays of 1,000 electrodes on the surface of the brain, we might be able to get out a little bit more information and a, in a more reliable way than using arrays of 100 penetrating electrodes to make a reliable, long-term neuroprosthetic device. So I'd like to acknowledge my support. Uh, we have an award from Cure and NYU Wireless. And uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, and of course, well, I'm recruiting. So take a look at the website if you're interested for all the students who are graduating. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, those are good questions. So the implantable devices today either have um, uh, non-rechargeable batteries. So some of them, you design the system to last five years on a battery, and then you do a surgery to replace the battery. And for some of those implants, the electrode stays in. You remove the, the pulse generator, the whole implant, and you replace that part and you reuse the existing electrode. Other systems are rechargeable. So there are um, uh, a device in trials that is, it is rechargeable, that's implanted here, uh, and the leads are tunneled up to the head. And then the patient every day puts on a thing that looks like a scarf while they're watching TV, and that inductively recharges the battery. Uh, and so for devices that really have high drain, that's, that's the only way you can, you can achieve what you need to do. But you're still pretty limited, even with rechargeable batteries, to what you can do uh, in the long term. The other type of devices that don't have batteries at all, like cochlear implants, they have uh, inductive links that supply all of their power. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, some work by Justin Williams at the um, University of Wisconsin is looking at this. And so 
we sort of think that, well, surface electrodes, they don't do anything, they're pretty inert, you're not penetrating into the brain, um, and you're on top of membranes, but there is a significant amount of growth of tissue that sort of comes around and encapsulates things, and, and uh, we don't think it really affects the signals you're recording, since you're recording from such large groups of neurons. Um, you're recording from thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of neurons still. Um, but it's interesting to see how that's going to affect uh, your electrode, actually the brain from your electrode. And so some of the work he's done is basically putting holes within the, uh, in the electrode, allowing CSF to circulate, because if you have this big plastic sheet, you're impeding the ability for, um, for diffusion to occur. Um, so we're going to try, to try and look at that, and we may have to sacrifice some of our resolution to incorporate that, uh, that circulation into our devices. And that's very good. We're going to try to look at some of that. We're, doing, we're going to start doing chronic implants. Hopefully in the near future, so we'll see what happens when we pull out the arrays after a few months, what they look like. Thanks. Yeah. How consistent are those seizure patterns that you were showing, seizure to seizure and subject to subject? Or right. Do you expect real-time learning to happen in the device in order to counteract? Right. I, I wish I knew. That's the, that's the big question. Um, we have a few examples from just a small number of animals, so we can't really say conclusively um, how consistent they are between between different animals. They're probably going to be anim uh, patient animal specific. Um, in one example, in one animal, they seem consistent over a few hours and that they uh, have very similar kind of waveforms. Although within one seizure, there's one example where it progresses from one type of pattern to another to another. Um, so those are all good questions and hopefully we'll figure it out. And what is the cost differentiation between your new product and the, the standard current? Right, that's the tough question, is how do you get insurance to pay for these things? That's the huge, huge question, right? And all medical devices is, is uh, how can you fit in the existing cost structure? Um, so these devices now, the handmade ones they were, I was originally showing, they're silicone, they're pieces of wire, they're pulled by hand. Um, insurance pays about $1,000 each for them. So the question is, can we build these devices that are microfabricated, they're, they're difficult, can we make them the same cost? It, it might be a difficult question to answer, but hopefully w with enough lower cost as, as uh, flexible electronics sort of decrease in cost and decrease in difficulty, hopefully we get close to that price point. But right now it's much more expensive. So what are some of the other applications for this technology that you see in a longer term? Um, so, so definitely want to explore this area of brain machine interface. So looking at reliable neuroprosthetic technologies, doing cursor control, robotic arms, things like that. Um, we think we can have this reliable interface that um, isn't quite the same as spiking data, but hopefully provides comparable utility. Um, we're looking at some sort of basic neuroscience questions with it. We've done some auditory studies where we're studying uh, large areas of auditory cortex simultaneously um, while we're playing tones to animals, and um, some base, maybe some basic visual neuroscience uh, systems research. Um, we like to work with, we're trying to incorporate optical methods into the arrays as well, so we can, John Rogers demonstrate that they can build arrays of LEDs and photodiodes directly into the array. So if we can build electrical and optical methods in the same device, we can try and explore optogenetics, stimulation, and, uh, and infrared imaging, so in, um, blood flow imaging in the same device. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what we're going to find out, I think, is what is the spatial resolution? Um, some people say you don't need it. Some people say you need about three millimeters. Um, other people say you need, probably you need maybe a millimeter, maybe a little bit under a millimeter in human studies. Uh, and so we're going to try and basically build a device that covers a significant portion of motor cortex um, in primates and see how much, how many electrodes are useful and then see how our decoding performance uh, degrades as we recruit, reduce, you know, we subsample the contacts that are on the device. So I think we won't know until it's like spatial Nyquist. We won't know until we've oversampled. What are your seizure models that you use? That's another good, yeah, good one. That's um, so we're using very crude, very simple um, methods right now. This is uh, picrotoxin applied directly to the surface of the brain. So it's clearly not a very good model of of natural epilepsy. Uh, and so moving forward, we're going to do chronic implants in rats that have been treated with um, electrical stimulation or pilocarpine, but still not really ideal models of epilepsy. And so once we've sort of satisfied we can do that safely, our ultimate goal before, before human testing is to implant in uh, epileptic dogs. So at the University of Pennsylvania, we have, um, what's that? 
Yeah, or even, I think they might even just be all population. I, I think within the uh, dog population, I think they have epilepsy at the same rate. Some breeds might be more susceptible. They have epilepsy at 1% of the population, just like humans. Um, the seizure data it is indistinguishable from human, from, uh, human uh, EEG. And so we'd like to implant our devices in those animals and uh, as an ultimate test before we go, in, before we go into humans, human studies. Have you given any thought to the high density arrays in a needle format, like you mm. implant in yeah. globes, pelvis, pernus, or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I was just at the um, neural interfaces conference, and they, a lot of people are talking about very dense arrays for deep brain stimulation. Um, so they're building devices now, even without this technology, with just uh, plain wires, very thin microfabricated wires um, that have 32 or 64 contacts uh, in a stimulating electrode for DBS, so deep brain stimulation. Um, and so there's possibility we could try and um, help improve that, although when you're in a rigid uh, substrate, if you, if you can make a rigid electrode, you can use conventional silicon. Um, the other stimulating area that you, may, and you uh, remind me of is, uh, is retinal stimulation. So there's a possibility we could make a very dense stimulator for the surface of the retina for, for uh, a vision, visual prosthetics. Then it's a question of how, how many electrodes are really useful, are useful for that task. So, great. Can you say anything about, uh, I guess, about compatibility of long-term chronic implants? I mean, I guess the needle, some people say that it forms scar tissue and they and also, I guess, with uh, your stimulation, does it damage the tissue or cause problems over long-term use? Or? Right, right. Um, so we don't know a lot of that yet. Um, there is some work on passive electrodes, on devices that are just surface electrodes, just pieces of metal and wires that have been implanted, implanted on the surface and seem to show good biocompatibility and that they seem to record reliable signals over a very long period uh, without degrading. Um, we won't know, we don't know anything about our devices yet. We haven't implanted them chronically yet. We think the same materials, um, as long as we can put the device together and hermetically seal everything, which is a big challenge, uh, we think they'll perform similarly. The basic brain machine interface will perform similarly. Uh, with stimulation, I think there's a lot of safety data from other, other devices about stimulation, but we won't know, uh, especially when we're stimulating from hundreds of contacts, but we're gonna try and stimulate from up to 512 channels. Uh, with different spatial and temporal patterns. We don't know about the efficacy of doing that or safety of doing that. What can you say about kind of, um, what was your career path to get from, I guess you were an EC undergrad to uh, yeah. a neuroengineer, a real neuroengineer? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so I, I, I sort of ran, randomly, uh, randomly wandered into this, I guess, but um, so I did my undergraduate and master's degree in, in electrical engineering. I started off um, in double E, and then I worked in the wireless industry for a little while. I started, went to a startup company um, that was doing a new type, type of broadband wireless uh, mobile data, um, which was really interesting. We had a great, great product, great system we were developing, and uh, I really enjoyed being in a startup environment. When we were acquired, I decided to, we were acquired by Qualcomm, I decided to go back to grad school, and so I went to um, switch fields over to bioengineering, so I thought, there's not a lot in pure ECE research, I think, left, especially in the era of wireless. But of course, I'm being proven wrong by NYU Wireless, which is a new group unplugging that's uh, at NYU. And uh, so I changed fields of bioengineering. I worked with Brian Litt, who's a neurologist, uh, whose big interest is in epilepsy and making better devices for treating epilepsy. And so that's how I got into this field. So I immediately tried to, tried to learn as much neuroscience as possible. So I took the neuroscience graduate courses and tried to uh, tried to go from pure engineering to learn a little bit of neuroscience, um, and then continued as a postdoc um, in the same lab for a short time, and then interviewed and uh, joined NYU, where we're starting to build um, we're starting to build a little bit of neuroengineering uh, there. Not nearly as, a, as much as you have going here, but we're trying to grow and leverage the strength of uh, neuroscience and uh, the hospital. When you start off as an undergrad, did you have any thought that you might end up here? Or uh, no, no, I didn't really. Uh, I did a, a few bio-related projects uh, for my master's, but I didn't quite uh, have this plan in mind. It just kind of went with, I think, what happened. So. But it's definitely been a very enjoyable, very enjoyable uh, research track uh, so far. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much.